going to be finishing our sermon series today, which we've been calling uh, Esther, God Behind the Scene. And we're going to be covering chapters 8 to 10, actually only 8 and 9, but for chapter 10, it's only three verses. So I'm going to leave for you to read that, those verses. Our message today is entitled, In the End, God Wins. In the End, God Wins. Let's uh, open our Bibles to Esther chapter 8. Let's read verses 1 to 8. Can I invite everybody to please rise up again from your seats? Let's read Esther chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 8. Amen. That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, and Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him, if it pleases the king, she said, and if, it, if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamedatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? And King Xerxes replied to the Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have hanged him on the gallows. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for just allowing us once more to be here together as a church. Father, we are truly grateful for your faithfulness. And this morning, as we take this time to study your word, we humbly ask once again that your Holy Spirit will be the one to move in our midst, to speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will go beyond the preparations that I have made, you will be the one to open our eyes and encourage us from your word today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please take your seats. <clears throat> how, many, how many of you have ever heard the phrase, between a rock and a hard place? You know what that means, right? It usually means being stuck in a situation where you have to choose between two equally difficult alternatives. Well, that's actually the feeling that I have with this last message of Esther. See, chapters 8 to 10 is the most challenging chapters in the book of Esther because here you will read basically about two things. First, we'll read about a festival named Purim that Christians do not celebrate. Most, of course, or not all of you who are here today are not Jewish, right? We are not in a synagogue. And Purim today is called the Jewish Mardi Gras, which gives it a negative connotation. So the challenge for me is this, what's the relevance, right? Now secondly, there's a lot of violence and vengeance that you'll read in this last chapters, which for some people will not easily sit well with them. And just for me, skipping over this section is it's not an option given that we as a church have been reading through the book of Esther, diva. Right? And so I cannot just end the sermon series in chapter 7 and say, okay, that's it. You're, you're, you'll take care of the rest of the chapters. The reality is reading these last few chapters actually poses some difficulties. For instance, when you read verse 11 of chapter 8, it says, the king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their 
enemies. So that's what's going to happen. That's the edict that has come out. Then look at Esther chapter 9, verse 5. It says, the Jews struck down all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and they did what they pleased to those who hated them. Then jump to verse 16. Verse 16 says, Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed how many? 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. And then we read also in chapter 9, verse 16, this very controversial text. It says, If it pleases the king, Esther answered, Give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged on gallows. So apparently this nice and beautiful queen is no longer the queen that we read about in Esther chapter 1 and chapter, I mean chapter 2. Now there's a lot of things in these chapters that, that are challenging to say the least. Now, even in my reading from commentators, there are many legitimate questions that are being raised and asked even by the Bible scholars. And so, you know, rather than avoid this section, I'd like to use this as an opportunity for us to learn better and to see how better to grasp the book of Esther. Now, if you are a serious Bible student and you want to know what God has to say, there are three realities that you have to constantly have in your mind. There's, first of all, the historical reality. I mean, you're going to ask, what is this text saying in the context of the writers, the readers of that time? What's actually going on in the text? Because after all, we are thousands of years removed from the text, right? And we have what we call the experiential reality. The experience, how does it connect with us? What is the significance for me, the reader? How do I make sense of it? And how do I apply it, apply it in my life? How, how do I live it out, right? If you've been in our church for quite a while, you know this. You go to the small group, that's what you see. You talk about what the meaning of the text is. You talk about how it applies to your life. You listen to the sermon, that's what you hear as well, right? What does this mean? And how does it apply to me? Now, most people tend to do the, just two of the three, and the most part, it's sufficient. That's why most people don't go to the third part. But you see, when you deal with passages like what we just read today, you don't actually know what to do it, with it, right? I mean, you can't apply that. For example, you read about the Jews killing 75,000 people. You can't say, okay, that's fine. I'll apply that. I mean, how does it work? What do you do with that, right? So there's a third reality that we also have to keep in mind, and it's what we call the redemptive reality. See, when you read the Bible, you have to see each section in view of how God or the overarching plan of God. What is His plan in redeeming humanity? When we study scriptures or any part of it, we must also ask the question, where and how does this particular section or this particular part that I'm reading and studying move the narrative of God's purposes forward? What is he doing in this story that puts in motion his overall purposes and plan of redemption? Okay, I, I, did you get that? Um, so let, me, let me simplify it. Remember a few years back, we, we as a church, we went through the story series. How many of you have been a part of that series, right? In that series, what? We studied the chronological story of the entire Bible. And we looked at the big stories of God's workings. And we realized when we studied that, that the ultimate goal of God, when you read the entire Bible, is that God wanted to save mankind so that we can be brought back to relationship with Him. Diba? And during that series, we did that for half a year, diba? What we did every Sunday was we looked at three different levels, if you remember that. There was the upper story, right? We even had a little bit of a higher uh, platform that I will go up. We looked at the upper story, then we had the lower story, and we had what we call my story. In the lower story, we were talking about what? The human history of real people, real places with real feelings, with real faith, of the people in the ancient times. 
So that was the lower story. That was what was happening in the text itself. That's the historical reality that I just talked a while ago. Now we read passages in the time where it really happens. And then there's what we call the my story, right? Where we ask the question, what does God want to do in and through this passage for me? We ask, what has this got to do with me? How does this impact my life, right? That's the my story part. That's the experiential reality that I just talked about because um, the Bible, when you read the scriptures, you will read it, you're not there, right? But the experiential part now has to come into place because you don't wanna read the scriptures and just put head knowledge there. It has to apply in your life. So that was the, what, my story. And then we have what we call upper story, diva. Right? This is where we step back and try to understand the story from the perspective of God. How his hand was moving in this particular story. How he is reaching out with love. How is he is moving through human history. And because when we read the scriptures, we must realize and we must also remember one thing. It's not our story. Amen? The scriptures is about God's story. God is doing something. There is an upper story. It's the redemptive reality that we must try to understand. And although we know that God loves us, God is faithful in our lives, God is ultimately in full control of everything, we must also remember and understand that God has a big purpose. God has an upper story. God has a purpose and a plan. And, and we want to try to see what, is, what that is, okay? So wh what I'd like to do today is I want to approach our study from these three vantage points. We're going to look at the historical reality or the lower story. We're going to look at the experiential reality or my story. And then we're going to look at the upper story or what we call the redemptive reality. Okay? Sounds like a bit theological, but it's really not. So let's begin with the historical reality or what we call the lower story. And the question you want to ask here is this. What's happening here? What's going on in the story? Now remember, as we have studied through the book of Esther, Esther was interceding for the people of God who were living under a very unstable king and one who had been deceived, right, into making a decree in order to have all the Jewish people in the provinces of Persia killed on a particular day. Now in the last two weeks of our study, we have seen the tables finally turned, right? Haman was executed, and Mordecai was now given the signet ring, which we read a while ago in chapter 8, verse 2. And he has become second in command uh, of the entire Persia, next only to the king. Yet the Jews were still actually in danger. Why? Because the decree was still in effect. And in about nine months, it will be carried out. So here's what happened in verse 3. It says, Esther again pleaded with the king falling at his feet and weeping, and she begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which she had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. Now what happened here? Why did the king extend his scepter again to Esther? Remember, the only person, I mean, he only did that to what? When someone went before him without being summoned, right? Remember that? You cannot go to the king unsummoned. And if he does not extend his gold scepter to you, you're as good as dead. And so that is what Esther has done again here. Now, you have to understand a little bit of the events here. In Esther chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Remember, Mordecai and Esther waited for actually a period of about two months to see if the king would figure out a way to reverse the irreversible edict, edict that, that Haman made, okay? So how do we know that it's two months? Actually, we, um, when you read the book of Esther, the writer puts in a few points or timelines in the letter, uh, in, in the book. In Esther chapter 7, verses 3 and 13, you don't have to go there, it tells us that the entire chapters 3 to 7 of Esther took was only a span of about one week, okay? 
Now, when you read Esther chapter 8, verse 9, no need to go there as well, you will see that the scribes were called in the third month of Sivan. So when you do the calculation, that's about actually seven days, or about more than two months. Two months had actually passed between Esther chapter 8, verse 2, and Esther chapter 8, verse 9. So here we see Mordecai was honored in chapter 8, verse 2. Everyone went home. They thought, you know, the king has enough common sense to think of a way to save the Jews from destruction. Two months had passed. Nothing was heard of a way of a royal edict. I'm sure, you know, Esther, Mordecai, and the Jews were probably beginning to worry. So finally, Esther had to go back before the king again. She apparently goes unsummoned because the king once again extended his scepter to her. So it's important for us to note here that Esther once again risked her life. Now remember, if, you are, if we are following the story here, remember that Esther and Mordecai are already in a good place, right? Haman has been killed. Esther has already, uh, I mean, Mordecai has already been given the signet ring. They are basically okay, right? So there were many reasons where Esther would have said, you know, Let's just let this go, diba? But no, once again, we see that she goes and risks her life for the Jewish people. And in verse 5, it says, If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamedatha, the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to, de to see the destruction of my family? And so this time, Esther makes an impassioned plea to the king. When you read the king's reply in verse 7, it would seem that he was responding kind of like defensively here because in his mind, the king actually feels that he has already addressed the problem. He's probably saying, you know, Haman has been hanged. I've given you the estate of Haman. Mordecai is now second in command. And so, and so that's what he was probably thinking. But then the king also tells her, and now he offers Esther and Mordecai basically to authorize them to make another counter decree. But the challenge of this new edict will be what? To address you know, the Persian laws that were basically irrevocable. And even the king of Persia could not overturn the decree that Haman made. And so here we find in verse 11, here's how the decree, the new decree goes. It says, the king's edict granted the Jews in every district the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, to kill, and annihilate any armed force of any nationality or province that might attack them and their women and children and to plunder the property of their enemies. So this, if you actually read carefully this counter edict, it actually is, it runs very parallel to the edict of Haman in chapter 3. It's basically saying that the Jews can fight, they can stand up, they can come together, they can annihilate, they can destroy anyone who seeks to do them harm, right? So Mordecai simply makes a new law for the Israelites to be able to defend themselves against the attackers that was brought about by the law of Haman. So now, you know, with this edict, um, the Jews now have a fighting chance. It also implies, because it was signed by the king, that the king was now supportive of, of this new law. And when you read Esther chapter 8, verses 15 to 17, you will read that the news was received with joy with gladness by the Jewish people as well as the people of Susa. Now, here's the thing. The story does not end there. It would have been nice that, you know, finish the story, you know, they, they found a way to, to get around with the edict, but that's not what happens. When you go to chapter 9, the writer records for us what actually happens when that day came. In chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, it says, On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. Remember, there were two edicts here, right? There was the edict by Haman and then the edict written by Mordecai. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped 
to overpower them. But now the tables were turned, and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in the cities in all their provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because of fe fear of Mordecai had seized them. So here we see the reversal in the book of Esther, right? That day that was destined for the destruction of the Jews became the day of their, of their deliverance. And how did it go? How did it go? Well, the account of the killing and the slaughter we'll find in the next verses. For example, in verse 6, it says here, In the citadel of Susa, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. Verse 15, The Jews in Susa came together on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they put to death in Susa 300 men, but they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Verse 16, we read this a while ago. Meanwhile, the remainder of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also assembled to protect themselves and get relief from their enemies. They killed 75,000 of them, but did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now, these are very significant numbers, right? But also in this chapter, we also read about the sons of Haman. Apparently, they had joined in the attack, and they were also killed. And these were the very sons. Remember, Haman was very proud not only of his wealth, he was proud of his sons, right? These were the very sons that Haman had. And their death actually symbolizes the, the final demise of their father. In verse 7, look at what it says. They also killed Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridatha, Parmashta, Arisai, Aridai, and Vaizatha, the ten sons of Haman, sons of Hamedatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they did not lay their hands on the plunder. Now, Bible scholars note two things here. First, is that when you read the Hebrew, um, something is very different. What they did was they did something that they did with no other names or list of names in scriptures. In the original Hebrew text, the names of the ten sons of Haman are organized in a column, spaced out and set apart from the rest of the text. I think you can imagine how it's written. So there's the text, and then there's that list, and then another text. It's never done. It's never done in the scriptures. It's very unusual. And some scholars believe that this was kind of a way to communicate the idea that these enemies of Israel had been set apart for destruction, kind of like a, a hit list, a, you know, a 10 most wanted list, kind of something like that. Then secondly, each of the names of these 10 sons of Haman in the Persian language actually contains the word self. Very interesting. He named, Haman named his 10 sons after aspects of self. For example, let me read some of this to you. Parshandatha means curious self. Dalphon means self-pity. Aspatha means assembled self or self-sufficient. Poratha means generous self or self-indulgent. Adalia means weak self or more likely humble self. Imagine humble self, you know. Uh, Aridatha means strong self or self-assertive. Pa Parmashta means preeminent self or self-ambition. Arisai means bold self, or I am bold. Aridai means dignified self, or I am superior. And Vaisata means pure self, or self-righteous. Gives us another idea of what kind of man Haman really was, right? And of course, the listing of these names tell us that all of these selves have been put to death. Very interesting. So we read about the slaughter of the enemies of the Jews, and we also read about the death of the sons of Haman. Now in verse 12, chapter 9, we are brought to a setting where Circes and um, Esther is having a conversation. Circes reads the reports of the dead in Susa to Esther. And then strangely, he presents Esther with another offer. 
He tells her, whatever you want, what do you want, Esther? Whatever you want, I will give them to you. Here's the thing. In verse 13, we read this a while ago. Here's another very challenging aspect of the book. Esther's response here, look at what she says. If it pleases the king, give the Jews in Susa permission to carry out this day's edict tomorrow also. In other words, another day to kill the enemies. And then let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the on gallows. Now, the, the, the second part there of, it sounds quite a bar barbaric, right? But it, it was actually a custom of ancient warfare to have your enemies hanged like that. But the other part of her answer also gives to us a lot of, a bit of a question. Bible commentator Karen Jobes notes that this request for another killing day was almost, you know, universally negatively looked by Christian and Jewish interpreters. They found this morally disturbing and unbecoming of a woman. Yet the writer of the book does not make any comment, no explanation to exonerate or to convict Esther here. And the question that is asked is, why would Esther request for a second day of killing? Right? Some think she has become, you know, bloodthirsty and, you know, power has gone to her head. Some other people think that, you know, she wanted to ensure the removal of all the Jewish, the enemies of the Jews from Susa. And maybe she had, she had become aware of further threats to the Jewish people and maybe realize that they need another day to, to finish it all off. But we don't really know, okay? But nine months later, we see here a very different Esther, right? When you read Esther in Esther chapter 2 and then Esther, the, the, the earlier chapters, now we read here Esther was very queenly and she said, King, give me another day. Now, we don't know the reason why Esther asked for a second day, but we'll read that Circus grants her request. So there were actually not one day, but two days of the slaughter of the enemies of the Jews. So those are very pretty challenging passages, right? When in chapter 9, verses 10, 15, and 16, and we've read some of this, those verses, you also have no, if you have noticed, the author was very, very repetitive when he tells us that the Jews, although they were legally allowed to take the plunder from their enemies, the Jews did not do it. This is to show that, that they were not vindictive or they were not there to gain from their enemies, but they, all they did was kind of like, you know, to protect their lives. It was all in self-defense. But still, when you read you know, these verses, these chapters, we are given some of these statistics, like 300 men who died in Susa, right? 500 men who died in the Acropolis of Susa, 75,000 people in the other parts of the emperor. And then we also read about the sons of Haman who were executed and put on the gallows. This was all brought about by the people of God. This was a slaughter. And, and so some people might be asking themselves, how do we make sense? sense of what we're reading here, right? Now, here's what I want you to understand. The writer of Esther clearly expects the reader to see these events as good news. The narrator clearly recognizes this as good news for the people of God, and the reader is, uh, is meant to be cheering when they read this. Now, why? Why should we be cheering? Because the story goes like this. We are reading about the story of a people who were under an unjust, an irrevocable sentence of death, and they were given a chance to fight for themselves, and they succeeded. That's the perspective that the author wants us to see. Now, how many of you have seen, for example, Schindler's List? And, and you see the Holocaust and, and the Jewish people crying out, longing for somebody to, to deliver them, right? that somebody would stop the killings. In, in 2019, we, we were able to go to Israel. We went to a, a place where they had um, Holocaust survivors. And when we went there, we would hear about their stories, their, what happened to them. There was this one particular lady. She was very old already, but she told us about the time when she was still a kid. 
and she was running for her life because her entire family has been killed. And so what we see in the book of Esther as something that's very shocking is meant to be good news because people who were unjustly condemned to die for simply being the people of God were now free to fight for their lives. And by the way, when you read it as well, you will see that those who died in the story are identified as attackers of the Jews. They were not random acts of violence here. So what do we, what we get out of this? What's the implication? Well, let me just give you a perspective on the timeline again. Remember, Haman wrote an edict, right? And when he threw that dice, 11 months later, the edict was supposed to be executed. But two months after, here we have Mordecai. Mordecai writes another edict, and so there were what? Nine more months before this edict was supposed to take place. And the reason that is important is that the people who were against the Jews knew that they had nine months to change their minds, right? They had nine months to walk away from their hatred and, re and reconsider. Apparently, Haman had, had done something to, to stir up a lot of other people when he wrote that edict. And you know, many people actually did. They, 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 they did do what Haman wanted to do, but many also chose to continue to go and attack the Jewish people. Apparently, there were a lot of Persians and non-Persians also who hated the Jews. And so we read the slaughter in these in this two chapters. So the question is this, what does this section tell us about God, about the character of God? And so we wanna point to these chapters and we have to see that this is what God was doing, is that God executes judgment. He is not just a God of grace, but he is also a God of justice. And we cannot ignore what we see here, right? God does bring about the judgment that he wants to bring, but when he does it, it is with ample opportunities for the enemies of God to change direction, to change their minds, to have a course correction, to repent, to have a change of heart. And we see that right here in the book of Esther. And isn't that what we see throughout the scriptures, right? In the Old Testament, there's the call to repent. And God says the, the people of, uh, the prophets tell the people of God and even the enemies of God to repent because God's judgment will come. In the New Testament, the, the gospel calls for repentance. We are not just said to we, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We are also called to what? To recognize that we are sinners and that we are called to repent from our sins, right? And in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 55, verse 6, here's what it says. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. That's, that's the call of God, right? In fact, that's an encouragement. It tells us that we have time. God gives us time to turn back from our sins. At the same time, it also tells us that there will be a time when it's going to be too late, right? Listen to these words from Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, you know what that day of the Lord is, right? That's the second coming of Christ. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. You see, in the time of Peter, people were mocking him and they were saying, you know what? Where's this coming of the Lord that you're talking about? You know, we're gonna be okay. Where's, the world's just gonna continue. We don't have to worry. And Peter says, God is patient. Because he wants everyone to come to repentance. But a day will come when God's judgment will take place. So friends, I want to tell you this. If you are toying with sin, if you are playing with fast and loose, and, you know, with living a godly life, whether you're a Christian or not, God is saying, I'm giving you time. I'm asking you to repent. Turn and receive grace from me and not 
judgment. Amen? Now, these are very, very important things for us to understand as well from God because a lot of times when we read the Scriptures, we just want to hear about the grace of God, the goodness of God, the faith. Amen. Amen. God is good. God is faithful, but God is also just. These chapters tell us that God's judgment will come. That's a lower story. That's the historical reality of these chapters. Now, let's look at the second part. Let's look at experiential reality or my story. What does it mean now to us? As we end the book of Esther, we will also, of course, realize that all throughout the book, there is no God that is ever mentioned, no prayer, no act of faith, no overt miracles. And yet God is totally in control, right? Even when he, he, it seems that he's not around. And the author continues, even up to the very end, he continues to invite us to reflect on our faith in a world where God seems to be absent. And the question to reflect is this, how do we live in light of the hiddenness of God? Right, because that's really the world where we live in today. There's no angel coming from heaven saying, this is what God wants you to do. There, there are not kind, those kinds of miracles that we, we see in the Old Testament that, that's happening today, right? We live in a world where it seems that science and psychology and Google is giving all the answers to the questions of life. And, and therefore, people say, we don't need God. But God is here. And the question of the hiddenness of God is very important for the Christian because we live in Esther's world today. Where the power, where people who don't even acknowledge God seem to be in control. Where we don't see the direct hand and intervention of God. And the question we must ask ourselves is, is are we going to adopt the worldview of faith or are we going to adopt the worldview of idolatry? Will we have a worldview of faith where we will align our lives to the promises, to the principles of the Word of God? Or are we going to adopt a worldview of idolatry where we have God replacements to help us navigate through life? I, mean, I tell you, we either live by faith or we live by God replacements or idolatry. And may I, may, may I say this? If you are not consciously choosing faith, you will, eventually, you will choose idolatry. If you are not intentionally aligning your life to line up with what God says, you are putting God replacements. You will put idols in your heart. And this happens when life is good and when life is bad. When your dreams crumble around you and life gets harder and harder, will you seek God in, your ref uh, in the midst of all your sufferings? and find refuge in him in the midst of your storm as you pray for strength to be able to suffer well? Or will you seek refuge and escape in the entertainments and the answers that the world gives? When you're put in a situation of pain or loss, do you continue to trust God by holding on to him and looking to him to protect and to provide? Or will you seek to handle your situations what, based on your skills? based on your influence, based on your intelligence, based on your connections? Will you let God give you new dreams when, we, when he takes away your old ones? But it's not just a negative, right? It's also when, when things are going well, when your dreams, your aspirations are just coming all together and, and the successes that you have seem like they, they're there because of the wisdom and strength of your hand. Will you still remember to be generous, to be kind, to be humble? Will you still remember the, the neediness of your soul, the lowly state that you are in before God? When life is secure, when, when money is the bank, when, when you find strength in your hands, will you remember that you aren't really the one that's in control? When you have all that you want, will you still believe that Jesus is all that you need? You see, whether we are struggling or whether we are victorious, the hiddenness of God either strengthens our faith or it takes away our faith. So how do we live in a world where God is not showing up every day or at least overtly? 
You know, we've got to make a choice. We've got to live by faith or else we will live with God replacements. And that's what the author is trying to remind us of. But here's the thing. How do we do that? How do we get there? Because it's not a matter of looking at Esther and doing what she did. Remember? We have seen in the story, Esther joined a harem. Are you going to join a harem? She deceived her husband. She did not show forgiveness or kindness to Haman. She asked for a second day of killing. And you cannot say, you know, Esther did it this, did this, this way, you know, I'll do it that way. It'll turn out okay. That's not the principle there, right? And I know some of you are, are looking at the book of Esther because we have started, and when we started the book of Esther, we saw her humanity. We saw that Esther was, was a lot like us, right? And, and some of you are thinking, you know what? I'll do what Esther did, and it'll be all right. And you're Toying with that thought. And what about Mordecai? Mordecai is rising up to preeminence here, right, in, in this story, and he plays an important role in the last chapters. And you will see that even in chapter 10. Now, while it is true that Mordecai was being used by God, let's remember that, you know, he was the one who started the problem in the first place, right? When he did not bow to Haman, it was not an issue of worship. Biblical scholars tell us that it was not because he did not, he, they were called to worship Haman. When he did that, why? Why did he do that? It was he who told Esther not to reveal her Jewish heritage. And he added more trouble when he refused to bow down to Haman the second time. And when we read, for example, in chapter 9, verse 3, that Mordecai, I mean, fear of Mordecai had seized the people when he became already the second in command. That means, that gives us an idea that Mordecai was not really humble or meek in his leadership, right? So at the very least, when you look at Esther, when you look at Mordecai as heroes, you will see heroes with many shortcomings. They join the long list of imperfect heroes in the Bible who play a crucial role. God used them, right, in his story of salvation. But they are not the role models. It's not a matter of, this is what the Bible teacher does, uh, the, this Bible character does, so this is what I have to do. Not just with Esther. Think about David. You know what David did in the last part of his life? He was responsible for killing thousands of people simply because he had a census made. He's not just about his, his adultery. And you know, that's not it, right? So this is where the third perspective of understanding Scripture comes in. We have to grasp the redemptive reality or the upper story of God, because understanding the story from God's perspective changes the way we respond to circumstances. We do not look at people, we look at God. And I think we will get a glimpse of that when we look at the festival of Purim. In verse 9, I mean chapter 9, verse 26. Here's what happens, right? When they had slaughtered and won the victory, they had a festival made. Verse 26 says, Therefore these days were called Purim, from the word Pur, because of everything written in this letter and because of what they had seen and what had happened to them. The Jews took it upon themselves to establish the custom that they and their descendants and all who joined them would without fail observe these two days every year in the way prescribed and at the time appointed. Now the word Pur, as we have remembered, is the word for Lot. Right? And so they have named their festival after the casting of lots. And who used the casting of lots? Remember, it wasn't Esther, it wasn't Mordecai, it was not the Jews, right? It was, it was Haman. So Mordecai named the festival after what Haman did. And so this item that was used by Haman to make a decision about when to kill the Jewish people has become the symbol of God's deliverance through circumstances. And what the world uses, God turns it around for his own purposes. And you know, Jews today, they continue to observe the festival of Purim, or it's called the Jewish Mardi Gras. 
It's widely criticized by a lot of conservatives because, you know, it includes a lot of partying, abundant food, and drink. It's very much like what we call, what we have today, the Sinulog, right? In the book of Esther, in its entirety, when, when they have this celebration, when they have this festival, they, they would read the book of Esther in its entirety in the synagogue. And during the reading, they will bring noisemakers. Uh, you know, people will cheer when Mordecai's name is read and, and boo when, when Haman's name is read. And Purim is a holiday that the Jews continue to celebrate as a sign and as a reminder for them that they will never be destroyed as a people. This generation, particularly this generation of Jews, I believe, identify with this festival best because of the shadow of the Holocaust. Now, I, I read about a courageous celebration of Purim, which included no wine, no food, no pastries. I mean, you know, the, the celebrants were barely alive. There were 80 Jewish men crammed in the concentration camp during the Holocaust. Their bodies were, you know, were, were racked with sickness, dysentery and typhoid. Their clothing hung like rags because of their skeletal frames. They subsisted on a daily portion of bread and soup. They had no hope. They had no solution. They were prisoners of, of you know, of Auschwitz. And there's this guy named J.J. Cohen who was among them. He was a teenager then living in a Polish ghetto. And when he was taken to the death camp, but he survived the Holocaust and was able to remember the day that he, together with the prisoners, celebrated Purim. He recalled how they took a piece of potato and, and a piece of bread and passed it from person to person in order to fulfill the tradition of giving gifts to one another. And it fell upon J.J. Cohen to relate to the group the story of Esther. And here's how he described that moment. Let me read what he says. He said, when I read aloud about Haman's downfall, the spark of hope deep inside every Jew's heart ignited into a flaming torch. And when I finished, everyone cheered. For a brief instant, the dreadful reality of the death camp had been forgotten. All the hunger and suffering had receded. And having exerted all my remaining energy in my reading of the story, I was breathless, but with my spirit soaring. And like a river overflowing its banks, the festive atmosphere and the vision of redemption burst out of the broken hearts of the camp inmates. Can, can you try to imagine those men, skin and bones and sickly? Try to incline your ears into this moment when you hear their cheers, although they are weak and yet they are triumphant, right? And, and you begin to wonder, what kind of a story can do that? What sort of narrative has the power to lift the spirits of you know, dead men walking. Do we not need such a story today? A lot of people are worn out, right? The past year has taken its toll upon the country, upon families, upon us. Depression, we have anxiety, mental illnesses, even quiet struggles are all around us. People are in desperate need of hope. And this is where the upper story of Esther becomes very, very relevant. You see, the book of Esther gives us a foretaste of the ultimate deliverance and the blessings of God on his people, as well as the future judgment and destruction of the enemies of God. Purim celebrates a historical reality that points to a future hope. And yet for Christians, we have a greater hope. Because unlike the Jews, we have a story of redemption that has already won the final victory on the cross. And the upper story of God in the book of Esther is this, God triumphs. We have cause to celebrate, right? But more so for the Christian because Jesus did not just win a victory, he has triumphed over sin, he has triumphed over death, and that ensures our future, that is our hope. But until Christ comes again to consummate that victory, there will be battles that still have to be fought. There will be wars that still have to be engaged. You and I are in this in-between time, right? And when we read Esther, that's exactly what's happening with us right now. We are living in between Christ's first coming and His second coming. And in this battle, we know there's going to be conflict. There's going to be casualties. There's going to be defeats. But there's also going to be what? There, there's going to be triumphs. There's going to be advances. There's going to be victories. 
but our joy hinges on whether we understand the upper story of God. The people of God have a champion. Jesus Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father. The enemy has been defeated. The battle has been won. Amen? That is the redemptive reality that you and I ought to see. No matter what happens in life, whether good or bad, so the question is, how do we live this life in view of the hiddenness of God? Because truth to tell, challenges sometimes are really hard, right? The temptations to find God replacements are very strong. There's a lot of sorrow and, and, and pain around us, and it saps, us with, from, it saps our joy from us. We need a perspective. We need a Purim perspective. And I, I'm not saying we have to celebrate Purim. We're not Jews, right? But here's where the section of the book of Esther helps us remember the upper story of God. We have to be able to see and understand that God wins. Let me share to you this illustration from Max Lucado. Some years ago, he, he, something unique happened to the San Antonio Spurs in the final game of the regular season. And the regular season was the, this, this was, this was the unique situation because in that season, the outcome of the game did not matter. The Spurs had such a terrific season that they were, they were secured for the playoffs. They had such a great lead over the second place team that nobody could catch them anymore. But there's, here's the thing, they had to play this one particular game because it was on the schedule. Whether they won or lost, it didn't matter. They could not lose even if they lost. And, and you know what? That's really where we are today. That's the spot where Christians are. You see, we have already won. Because the death and the resurrection of Christ has already given us the victory. We cannot lose. We are guaranteed victory. No one can snatch us from the hands of the Father. Yet still we have a few games to play, right? The season is not quite over. So how do we behave in the meantime? And the game of the San Antonio Spurs can teach us something. Here's, here's what uh, Max Lucado tells, because he went and watched the game. Here's what happened. is that the team showed up, they played hard, they had a great time, and they won the game. Even post-game, <laughs> Analysts say, you know, they were, they were so relaxed. They were so confident. You see, something happens when you know that you've already won. You play harder. You show up. You stay strong. And I encourage you, friends, to, see, to do the same. In these last days, for us to show up, to play hard, to celebrate our victory in Christ Jesus, and to be assured that our God will keep his covenant. Amen? Here's how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because in the end, God prevails, God wins, and because God wins, we win. Amen? Praise the Lord. And so we see three perspectives from these last few chapters of Esther, right? The historical reality, we see God, a God of justice, who executes judgment. He is a holy God. The experiential reality reminds us that even in the hiddenness of God, we are to live by faith. And the redemptive reality, there's no question whether God wins or not. He wins all the time, amen? The question is, are we gonna live in view of the victory of God? And we have learned some great lessons in the story of Esther. I hope you enjoy the study. I have learned a lot. I hope you have as well. God is never mentioned in the book of Esther, but his mark is everywhere, right? And we have seen God work with imperfect people to save the Jews.
from destruction. And we know that God can work with imperfect people like us as well. And through this remarkable story, we are reminded that God does not forget his own. And we have seen in our study that though God's hand moves invisibly, he does so with invincibility, bringing his sovereign plan to completion. And ultimately, this story lets us know that our God, our God wins. He is victorious. Amen? Amen. And every day he opens the door. It is his invitation to all of us to come out of the little dark rooms in which we may be living and into the great and joyous adventure of life that he calls us to be with him. In the end, God wins. And because your life and my life is linked with God's through Jesus Christ, we too shall win. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Can I invite everybody to please stand up from their seats as we close in prayer? Lord, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful sermon series that we have gone through in the book of Esther. Thank you for the many lessons that you have taught us. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will be the one to to remind us and encourage us and allow us to see that you are the God who wins. You are the God who is victorious. You are God. And we worship you. We worship you for who you are. We worship you for your faithfulness. We worship you for your holiness. We bow down before you, Lord. 